In this session, in our study of the God that we worship, we want to continue our examination of the names and titles of God. In the last session, we looked at the supreme name of God, the name by which He revealed Himself to Moses and by which He declared that He is to be known unto all generations, the name Yahweh. Now I'd like to move for a second away from names, but we'll come back to names later, to the title that is most frequently used for God in the Old Testament. And that title is the name or the title Adonai. And it appears, I can't even spell with, uh, with a teleprompter in front of me, Adonai. <laughs> Real ministers know how to spell, but I don't. Is a lengthened or extended rendition of the simple name Adon. And this word Adon occurs 330 times in the Old Testament. Now, when it occurs just like this, in the abbreviated form, it is used for God only 30 times. It appears 330 times, 30 times for God in this form, the short form, A-D-O-N. However, in the lengthened form, Adonai, it occurs 449 times, and, 300, and, and there with for God, and 315 in the 449. And don't you forget these numbers, because you can't really know Christian theology unless you understand the mathematical relationship between here. But there's a reason why I'm going through all of this. 449 times this name, Adonai, occurs in the Old Testament. 315 of those, it is linked immediately with the name Yahweh and is translated in this situation by the words, Lord God. Now, the Jews developed an extremely high respect for the name Yahweh. That was the name that is protected in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That was the name that Jesus included in the Lord's Prayer as the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, Hallowed be thy name. So that reverence for the name of God became so important to Jews that it became, for the most part, the ineffable name. So that in worship, the Jews would not speak aloud the name of Yahweh lest, in some way, they be guilty of violating the commandment of, using, of not using the name in vain. And so, as a result of that, Jewish, uh, the Jewish people developed substitute names or titles for God. And in the liturgy, whenever they wanted to use a substitute name for the ineffable name, Invariably, the choice was Adonai. So we know that this name, Adonai, is very, very important in Jewish theology. Now, what does it mean? What are its roots? Well, the short form, the root form, Adon, originally meant administrator or steward, according to William Foxwell Albright, the... Uh, the dean of Old Testament archaeologists. Albright says that the original meaning of Adon was simply uh, the name or the title given to a steward or a person in a management position of authority, an administrator. And so it could be used for human beings and was not restricted for God. For example, we see that an Adon is one who exercises the role of lord of a house, or lord over a manor, or lord or authority over a group of people. One of the root causes for the friction that occurred in the family of Jacob was that Joseph, who was younger than most of the brothers, exercised the role of Adon over his brothers. He, so to speak, lorded it over them. And that provoked 
their anger and their jealousy and their hostility. But of course, whenever he went down to Egypt and was elevated to the level of prime minister and the famine came and the brothers went down into Egypt and visited Joseph there, then they willingly addressed him as Adon, Lord. They submitted to this position of authority. We also see in ancient mythology coming over into other cultures, the Adonis figure, which has worked its way into our English language. What is the Adonis figure? If you would read in a novel, for example, a description of a character that he was an Adonis, what would you perceive that to mean? What? Now, come on, it's going to be, take the women to answer this question. I can tell that because the men are looking at me with blank faces. Paragon of manhood. A paragon of manhood. The Adonis figure is the one who is extremely well built. He's handsome. He's uh, athletic. He's like, he's heroic, but he is almost godlike. He is the supreme male, perfect male. He is the Adonis figure in literature is the male equivalent to the female ten. <laughs> okay. So again, he in a sense dominates over everything, the Adonis figure. Okay, but what we're most concerned about is not the root, but what happens when this little suffix is added, Adonai. What is the meaning of that? Now, there is some ambiguity and some difficulty in sorting that out historically and discovering why the root term Adam became Adonai. And uh, there are different views on that. Some say that it's simply a personal ending. But the most frequent view of Old Testament linguists is that the, the suffix ai added to Adonai was a suffix of intensification. Now, that's very significant for us. A suffix of intensification. Now, the suffix of intensification means simply that whatever the root word is, is intensified and elevated to the superlative degree. So that the difference between an Adon and an Adonai, in simple terms, is this, that an Adon is a person who is in a position of lordship or dominance over other people. Put that suffix ai on there and intensify the meaning of the root, and what do you have? The Lord of Lords, the ultimate Lord, the supreme Lord, the imperial Lord, the one who dominates over everything. So the simple way of, of uh, interpreting the term Adonai would be by the phrase, Lord of all, your ultimate Lord. So the significance of the title is that Adonai is the number one title for God which calls attention to his sovereignty, to his authority. Now. Some of you have already studied our series that we did on the person of Christ, where we looked at the names and titles attributed to Jesus in the New Testament. And perhaps you will recall that the title that is most frequently used for Jesus in the New Testament is what title? Yeah. No. The title most frequently used for Jesus in the New Testament. The title given to him more often by far than any other title. What? Christ. Exactly. That Christ is not a name. It's a title. In fact, that title is used so frequently for Jesus that we think what? It's his name. Like Jesus is his first name and Christ is his last name. But in, in Judaism, his name would have been Jesus bar Joseph or Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is his name, Christ is his title, and that means what? The anointed one or Messiah. So Jesus Christ means Jesus Messiah. 
the name plus a title. Now, the second most frequently used title for Jesus is the title Curios, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Adonai. It is the title Lord, used in its imperial and supreme sense. And this is significant because the New Testament writers consciously applied a title that they knew was reserved for God to Jesus. Remember Philippians 2, the canonic hymn that the Apostle Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, you know, thought it not uh, uh, a thing to be grasped. He didn't uh, covet this equality with God, but he emptied himself and took on himself upon the form of a servant and so on, became obedient unto death. Wherefore hath God highly exalted him and done what? given him a name which is above every name. Now, what is the name that is above every name? It's not the name Jesus. Okay? It, it's confusing there because it's the name above every name, comma, and at the name of Jesus, so that people think because the name of Jesus occurs next that that is the name that is given that is above every name. No. The name that is given that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow and every tongue confess that name, which is what? Lord. That Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In His ascension, in His elevation to the right hand of God, to the seat of cosmic authority, Jesus is given the title that in Old Testament terms is reserved for God, Adonai. The most frequently quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament is what passage? What Old Testament passage is, is quoted more of? Psalm 110. What happens in Psalm 110? The Scripture says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. Now, if you look at the text, the Hebrew says, Yahweh says to my Adonai, sit thou at my right hand. So that David is speaking about a conversation that God is having with David's sovereign. And David is the king of Israel. And how the New Testament makes such an important dimension in Jesus in his discussions with the Pharisees over the fact that Jesus is at the same time David's son He's the son of David, but he is also what else? David's Lord, which is unthinkable in Jewish categories that the son would be greater than the father. But in this unique instance, the son of David is also the Lord of David because he is the one to whom God promised the kingdom. God said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, and I will make all of the, give all of the kingdoms of the world to you, and so on, in Psalm 110. So the New Testament Jews understood the radical significance of that title, Adonai, and applied it to Jesus. Okay. Now, a couple of more expressions of it in the Old Testament. Psalm 8, O Lord, my Lord, or our Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent or how majestic is thy name in all of the earth. You're all familiar with that song. And it goes, O oh Lord, our Lord. But again, the Hebrew shows you that it is Yahweh, O oh Yahweh, our Adonai. This is one of those 315 times where the term Adonai is linked immediately with the name of Yahweh. O Yahweh, our Adonai, our Sovereign One, how excellent is thy name in all of the earth. So it's important that we understand not only the meaning of the term Adonai, 
but also the way in which it functions in Jewish worship, because we're concerned with worship here. It is the supreme ascription to God in worship. Oh God, you are our Adonai. We are here to prostrate ourselves before your authority and your sovereignty. We bow the knee. We give obeisance. We fall on our face recognizing that you are Adon, I, the Lord of all, the one who holds cosmic authority, that you reign over all other authorities. And conversely, in the New Testament, after the resurrection of Jesus, and he appears to the disciples, and Thomas is skeptical, and he demands to put his hands into the wounds, and Jesus appears. You remember Thomas's confession of faith. What does he say? My Lord and my God. My Adonai and my Yahweh. My sovereign one before whom I bow. He, in that moment, shows to us what worship is all about. Where we recognize the Lordship of Christ and of God. Now, Let's take a moment to look at this attribute of God, if you will, or a dimension of the character of God that is most clearly communicated by the title Adonai. And I've mentioned it already, the word sovereignty. That's a word that's become almost an obscenity to American people. One of my favorite illustrations of this that I've used in other lectures for other reasons, but I'll repeat it here, it goes back a few years when the Episcopalian minister, who at the time was a Christian folk singer, did some albums and that were uh, distributed throughout the nation, whose name is John Guest, came to this country now about 15 years ago from England, from Liverpool. and. When he came to the United States, his initial place of residence was in Philadelphia. He landed in Philadelphia and was having his virgin exposure to the culture of the United States. And the first week that he was here, he visited the historic sites in Philadelphia, the Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell and all of that, and then spent some time visiting the uh, antique stores that specialized in Revolutionary War memorabilia. Now remember, he's an Englishman trying to adjust to the new world, to the enemies of King George. If you've ever been to England, do you see what that cultural shock can be? If you've been to Westminster Abbey, how many of you have been to Westminster Abbey? To me, the most uh, uh, surprising thing about Westminster Abbey was to walk in there and see that Benedict Arnold is buried in Westminster Abbey in a hero's grave. He is the symbol of treachery to Americans because he was a traitor. But to their side, he was a hero and is buried in Westminster Abbey. Well, here comes an Englishman over here looking at these primitive uh, Americans and trying to understand their culture. So he goes and focuses attention on these landmarks that specialized in the revolutionary period. And he went into one of these antique stores, and he saw the placards and the signs that were used to communicate uh, patriotism during the years of the uh, War of Independence. Things like, no taxation without representation, don't tread on me, and so on. But he told me later that the sign that most attracted his attention was this great big uh, wooden plank at the top of the store that read, we serve no sovereign here. And when John Guest said that, he said, how can I be a minister of the gospel, a preacher to a culture that has built into their bloodstream and into their history an allergy, an antipathy to all things sovereign? How can you preach the kingdom of God to a people 
who despise kings. And he said he has found it difficult to communicate the whole concept of the lordship of Christ to the sovereign and the sovereignty of God to a nation of people who from the time they are children are, you know, educated to despise sovereignty. We pride ourselves in our independence, in our freedom, in our democratic spirit. But the kingdom of God is not a democracy. When Yahweh speaks in the Old Testament, He utters His law unilaterally. He does not rule by referendum. The Ten Commandments are not ten suggestions, are they? But he simply says, thou shalt not, exercising absolute authority over his creation and over his people. Sovereignty is essential to God, that it is, it is of his essence. And the minute we negotiate or water down the sovereignty of God, we are playing around with God's character. Let me say it in the simplest terms that I know how. If God is not sovereign, God is not God. Say it again. If God is not sovereign, God is not God. If you worship a God who is not sovereign, you are worshiping an idol. If you are worshiping a God who is not sovereign, you are worshiping an idol. Idols can be controlled. Idols can be dominated over. But when I stand before Almighty God, I am standing before the one who has absolute authority over my life, an authority that is based on authorship. He has authored me. He has created me. He has made me. I am His craftsmanship. Everything that I have that is of value, I receive from Him. He is my king. He is my sovereign one. And when we come into the church on Sunday morning and bow our knees and fold our hands, we are saying to Almighty God, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. You are the authority. You are the so, uh, sovereign one. I am subordinate. Now, this comes out in all kinds of theological debates over whether or not God is sovereign. I have heard this statement in, uh, with respect to certain theological debates uttered again and again with respect to the, the, the touchy and difficult question of predestination, and I'm not going to open up that right now. But to use it just for a means of illustration. When people debate that very, very difficult, excruciatingly painful concept of predestination, so often people will make statements like this, that God's sovereignty can never overrule man's freedom. Have you ever heard that? Maybe you've even said it, okay? If you have said it, I trust that God knows you didn't mean it or that you didn't understand what you were saying when you said God's sovereignty can never overrule your freedom. Because if that is true, then who is sovereign? You are. And if you really believe that, you are no Christian 
I mean, it's not just a theological error. If you really understand what you're saying and really believe what you're saying and understand, I'm not saying that if you say it, you're not a Christian. I'm saying if you understand the implications of what you're saying and still insist on it, you are no Christian because you have never submitted to the authority either of God or of Jesus Christ. You are still in a posture of cosmic treason and rebellion against your Creator if you think for one second that your will controls or limits the will of God. A sovereign God exercises sovereignty over all of His creation. And the better way to say it is, man has free will, yes. We're certainly not denying that man has free will, God forbid. And God has free will. God is free and man is free. But the better way to say it is this, that man's free will never overcomes <laughs> or limits God's free will. Because God is sovereign and we are not. That's why some of these theological debates are not just abstract theological debates, but they touch at the very heart of our being in terms of our soul's posture of submission and obedience to the God who is. So I ask you to think about the implications of this concept. And I ask you, when you come to church to worship, do you really? believe that God is the one who is the Lord of all. If you believe that, then you're on your face, never making demands to God, only making requests, because you recognize that it is He who has made you and not you yourself. All right, in our next time, we will look at the name of God, Elohim, that has become so problematic because it is the plural form for the name of God and has raised all kinds of difficulties uh, with respect to biblical understanding.